Those who are remaining in the sanctuary, if you would turn with me to Psalms chapter 42, verse 1 through 7. When you have it, say amen. Okay. Um, I'm a little old school, so I'd like us to stand for the reading of God's word, just in reverence to his word. And it reads, As a deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Mizar. Deep calls into deep at the noise of your waterfalls, as your waves and billows have gone over me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you once again for this opportunity to speak before your people, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that I decrease so that you may increase and that you will just have your way. We thank you for your presence this ne even now in this place. And we ask, Lord God, that you will just continue to have your way in this service as we go forth to worship and praise your name and as we go forth to speak thus say the Lord. I pray, Lord God, that the message will fall on fertile ground. And I pray, Lord God, it will accomplish what it's set out to do. I thank you in advance for what you're about to do. And I give you all glory and honor because you deserve it all. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So Psalms chapter 42, verse 1 through 7. As I was reading about the history of this passage of scripture, I noted that it says that the author, because, you know, when I was growing up, I always thought David wrote all the Psalms. But in the actuality, um, Psalms 42, it's the authors note that it was written by the sons of Korah. And I always noticed that, but I kind of just kind of glanced over it or, you know, glossed over that. I didn't understand who the sons of Korah were until I did a little study. And if you, uh, if you get an opportunity, I won't have you turn to it now, but Numbers chapter 16, verses 1 through 35, it talks about who the sons of Korah were. Korah, well, actually they talk about who Korah was. Korah was a person, he was actually a priest, he was a Levite priest, and it was during the time of Moses. And during that time, Moses was anointed to be, you know, the leader of the children of Israel as they were being led out of Egypt. And so as he was leading the people out of Egypt, there were some who were a little jealous because of the fact that they felt, why was it that Moses was chosen to lead the people out. Why couldn't we be chosen? We're just as good. We're anointed. We're just appointed. We should be the ones who are leading the people. Because after all, you know, we are Levites, if you will. And the Levites are ministers and priests. And I believe, you know, I liked what the commentator said. Um, he felt that, or he, he studied the scripture, and the commentator gave him a point that maybe it was that this Levite, Korah, was looking back at the Egyptians because it wasn't too long that they had gotten out of Egypt. And you see, the priests in Egypt, they had the best layout, the best of food, the best of living expense, the best of living. They lived in luxury. He forgot all about what God had done, Korah did, and he was just focusing on the luxuries of Egypt. How many times have we found ourselves in that situation where God's delivered us from something, we thank God for the moment, and then when trials come, we start wishing for that very thing we ask God to deliver us out of, amen? <laughs> and that's exactly what happened with the sons of Korah. They were so caught up and happy with I mean, well, not the sons, but with Korah. He was so happy and caught, he was so caught up in looking back at Egypt and all the past luxuries that the priests seemed to have that he forgot 
about the deliverance God had brought him from. And so it caused him to be jealous. And so he joined with a group, Dathan and Abiram, who had their own reasons for wanting to overthrow Moses' leadership. And so they went and challenged Abraham. I'm sorry, they went and challenged Moses to see who God really wanted to be in charge of the people of Israel. And for those of you who don't know the story, for those of you who already do, what happened? Moses said, okay, all those who are on Korah's side, stand with Korah. So God gave them an opportunity hundreds of years before uh, his sons wrote this psalm. And he gave them an opportunity, the people, to decide if they're going to stand with Korah and use him as their leader, along with Dathan and Abiram, or if they were going to follow Moses. So those who wanted to follow Korah went and stood by Korah. Those who wanted to stay with Moses stood by Moses. And what happened? God opened up the earth, and he swallowed up Korah, and all of those followers, including Abiram and Dathan, and all those people who wanted to rally and rebel against Moses. The danger of being jealous and envious of what other people have. And so as a result, what's interesting about what happened in that passage of Numbers chapter 16 was that normally whenever someone sins, you know, or someone goes against what God has called them to do, God will have the family taken out and stoned. But that wasn't the case. You didn't find that in Numbers 16. In fact, hundreds of years later, his descendants, Korah's sons, ended up being appointed musicians and singers and worshipers for the kingdom of God, which was amazing because of the fact that a lot of times when a, someone, when their father had sinned in such a great way, usually the whole family is destroyed. But in actuality, his sons were preserved. And what was interesting as I was reading this psalm was the fact that the sons had a different attitude when it came to God. They chose not to follow in the ways of their father and rebel when they started to feel disquieted or felt insecure or felt jealous or felt as if unworthy of what it is that God had called them to do. You see, when David appointed Korah's sons as musicians and as singers and as worshipers, that was a very big deal. Because when you think about it, when you have a lineage where someone was in rebellion, there's a natural tendency to want to stay away because you're thinking the sons of the the sins of the father will fall into the children of the third and fourth generation. But son, the sons of Korah were different. And the fact that they, even though their father had that stigma, they did not carry that stigma with them. And so they had a different approach to the way they approached God. In fact, if you look at Psalms chapter 42, verse 1, notice what it says. As a deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go with the multitude. And notice what he says, I used to go with the multitude, but this time they have chosen to follow God instead. Even in their hurt, even in their distress, even in all that they were going through, even in their history of seeing how their father chose to rebel against God, they made up their mind that they weren't going to follow in the footsteps of their father, but they were gonna foster their own walk with God, and they were gonna seek God for themselves. And I love how it says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for me. That used to be a song that we used to sing um, um, in the previous church when we were in Lanham a lot, as the deer pants for the water. I love that song because it's such a sweet love song to God, letting him know that as deer need water, so our souls need God. And that's what our soul needs, is God. Um, when I was asked by Brother George last week what my topic of sermon was, I just told him, deep calls to deep. He looked at me and was like, oh, okay. <laughs> he had no idea. I didn't either. I said, I don't know what I'm going to preach. I just keep thinking deep calls to deep. That's what came to my mind. And I didn't understand why is it that God laid that on my heart until I read that passage in verse 7. It says, deep calls into deep. At the noise of your waterfalls, all your waves and billows have gone over me. And as I was doing the study and looking at how, what that meant, what it was talking about is how, you ever watch the oceans? Anybody ever been to the beach? 
You ever watch the oceans, how they roar and how it's like they're talking to each other? It's like they'll, you know, you'll see it crush over each other and then it seems like they're answering each other. And that's what the psalmist was saying. Korah's sons were looking at the ocean, looking at the sea. They were looking at the water, this body of water, and they were watching how the deep was calling out to each other and speaking to each other. And that's how God, and he used it as an analogy of how God speaks to us in our deep and dark state. How God, who is the deep, deep. You know, God is deep, as we know. And God calls us to the deep. He calls us to the deeper things in him. See, a lot of times we want to stay on the shallow end where it's comfortable, where it's easy, where it's, you know, where we're comfortable, so to speak. And God calls us into the deeper things of him. He calls us into deeper places. That's why we have those periods where we have those, what they call the dark night of the soul. You know, that dark night of the soul is when you're feeling depressed, dejected, fallen, you know, kind of cast down. It was so funny because as I was preparing and studying about, you know, this lesson, the Lord laid on my heart again depression. Now I had spoken about depression for about two years ago, and Pastor had said that he wanted me to speak on it again. I had no intention of speaking on it <laughs> again. In fact, I, ha I didn't even want to speak about it the last time because it's not a subject that you really um, get that amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, depression. You know, it doesn't quite jump out at you like that. But the thing is, is that as I was preparing and studying, the Lord laid on my heart, you know, I kept hearing in the news um, this week about different artists and their battle with depression. Uh, many of you may or may not know of the singer Chris Cornell. He was um, a leader of the group, um, what was it, Sound? What was, I had highlighted it because I couldn't remember the exact name of it, but ooh. yeah, it was, I'm sorry, I can't hear you all. Soundgarden, that's it. <laughs> Soundgarden and Audio Slave. That was the name of his group. And it was so funny because at the reporter, as they were talking about, and then, you know, psychiatrists, you have all these people investigating what happened. He is 52 years old, and he committed suicide in the spring. You know, I learned an interesting thing as I was preparing this study. I learned that, you know, a lot of times people think, well, how many, let's do a poll. How many of you believe that people are most depressed during the holidays? That was always my thought, that during the holidays, you know, everybody gets, you've heard it probably preached, I probably have said it a few times, that the biggest time of depression is around the holidays. Did you know that the biggest time of depression is actually in the spring? I was shocked when I heard that. And that's what they were saying, is that the biggest, the, the time, the highest, um, the high point of depression is during the spring. And so a lot of times when, the springtime comes around and they believe it's because people are looking at pictures of people posting, oh, they're on vacation. You look around at our group, it's like, oh, half the folks are on vacation in luxurious places like Tennessee and Delaware and all these different places and I'm stuck here, you know? And it's a tendency to get jealous and feeling, uh, what they say, in your feelings, as the young people say, because of the fact that you don't have the luxury of being able to go away like everybody else does. And that depression starts to set in. Again, that jealousy about what other people have versus what we have, and we start to tend to draw inward and feel like if we don't have what we should have. And then you start feeling depressed and weighed down. Another instance, um, they talked about Mandisa. She's an artist, a Christian contemporary artist, and she was even sharing this past Thursday about her own depression. She had been praying and praying and praying that God would deliver her friend Keisha from this breast cancer. And as a result, she was praying and seeking the Lord, and what happened? They wrote this song together called Overcomer. You probably heard, I'm a, you're an overcomer, stay in the fight till the final round. Never heard of it? Okay. Well, if you ever listen to WGTS, I'm doing a plug, 91.9, you'll hear Overcomer by Mandisa. And it was a powerful song. I mean, that song gets you going. But it was so funny because even when she was singing that song, she just knew God was going to raise her friend up from cancer. And her friend died. And it devastated her when she found out that her friend died to the point that instead, you know how some people shake their fist at heaven and say, you know what, I'm cursing God and they just don't want to have anything to do with God anymore. Instead, what she did was draw inward. 
And it's funny because as she was telling her story, I could identify with that. Whenever I'm angry with God, I don't shake my fist or anything like that. I draw inward. I decide, okay, I'm not reading my Bible. I don't want to pray. I don't want to talk to God. I don't want to talk to God at all because I'm upset. And that's what she did. She drew inward. She decided she wasn't going to talk to God. She wasn't going to have anything to do with God. She decided that she wasn't going to read her word anymore. She wasn't worshiping anymore, wasn't praying anymore. Her friends tried to reach out with, to her. She refused to answer her phone. She just decided to draw inward. But what she talked about, what pulled her out of the darkness, was those flashes of light. And the flashes of light came when those loving saints wouldn't give up on her. She decided that she was going to go see the movie War Room. And she said that as she went to go see this movie, she saw um, how this woman got in her prayer closet, made a prayer closet, prayed, and all of a sudden God opened up the door for her, you know, opened up, I mean, the, the woman, the, the Lord opened up the door for the woman who prayed, and her prayer was answered. Immediately, Mandisa got upset. Oh, God did that for her. He didn't do that for me. She left the movie upset, decided to go watch another movie. She was just angry <laughs> because of the fact that all the movie did was bring up all the things that she was feeling about her anger and frustration about God disappointing her. And so it was so funny because when she had gotten out of the movie, she came to her car and all these love letters were covering her car. Her friends were stalking her, trying to find out where she was because she wouldn't answer her phone. She wouldn't come to the door when they'd go by and visit. So they had to literally camp out in front of the mall when they recognized her car and they decided they were going to camp out there and put all these love notes there and they were not going to let her go until they could get a hold of her. And I was so admiring this story when she shared that because that's the attitude that we should have as a body of believers is that when we see our brothers and sisters who are hurting, who are disquieted in their soul, when they're depressed, we should be reaching out to them and wondering what's going on, letting them know, hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. If you see that brother or sister who's missed a Sunday or two and you haven't heard from them, call them up. Find out what is going on. Why aren't you where you should be? Let them know that you're concerned and that you care about them because that's what her friends did and that was one of the flashes that got her out of her depression. Also, she said listening to a Chris Tomlin song helped pull her out of that depression. Also, she shared even in that glimpse where she did catch pieces of that movie, just hearing the word of God, even in that little, as much as she tried to shut God out, God still was able to reach her a little bit through that movie. And that's the wonderful thing about God is that no matter how much we try to push him away or try to act like we don't need him or we don't want to have anything to do with him, he doesn't give up on us. He is relentless. He continues to pursue us and pursue us and pursue us until he gets us where he wants us to be because he loves us ever so much. You know, I am so angry when I hear about how the enemy is trying to take our young people. You know, there's this um, new TV show on Netflix that's out called 13 Reasons Why. And in it, this young teenager is actually talking about why she kills herself. And she actually goes through this step-by-step -step process of explaining all the things that happen. She leaves these tapes behind, and then they show graphically how she commits suicide. And of course, the producers are saying, oh, well, we did this movie because we want to help the young people to know how to you know, combat whenever they're feeling this way. We wanted to show them this, there's a way out. But what upset me about the movie, and that's what the psychiatrists and the different authors are saying, is that or not the movie, but the TV show, is that it's not helping, it's becoming a contagion. What happens is they look at it, they see it, and they want to mirror it. And a perfect example, I was just on the phone yesterday because I was praying about, Lord, is this really what you want me to talk about with your people today? A minister yesterday called me up, told me how her granddaughter saw the show, decided that she was tired of being bullied in school. And she was in a private school, mind you, this was in public school, she was in a private school, and she was being bullied. And she decided that she was going to get, tell all of her friends goodbye that day. She let them all know, hey, I'm done. I'm not going to, you know, I decided to check out tonight, so this is going to be probably the last time you all see me. And, you know, just said her goodbyes to all her friends and decided that she was going to go home. But God, 
One of those friends said, "Uh uh-uh, we're not gonna let this happen. They decided to tell a teacher who told her parent who ended up getting her out of that situation. They ended up sending a psychiatrist and having her be delivered from that, praise the Lord. But God, I tell you, the prayers of the saints, the prayers of that grandmother, you see, we don't realize how truly powerful we are. The enemy desires to sift us like wheat, and he singles out different ones, and if he can isolate you, he's going to suck the very life out of you, and he's going to keep you in a place where he can continue to control you to the point where you think that there's no way out. But God wants us to know that he gives us these flashes of light to let us know that we are never alone. He's always with us. He said whether you make your bed in hell, he's still there with you. No matter where you are, he is still with you. And you should never ever feel that you're alone. God is always with you. He loves you. And he wants to pull you out from the depths of depression, the the depths of hopelessness, the depths of insecurities, those depths that you feel like if there's no way out. There is hope. There is a way out. God is in control. He loves us so very much, and he wants us to know that we don't have to be depressed. This season may be the season, the spring season of, you know, depression. In fact, even I was amazed when it was talking about the pilgrimage in Psalms 42, how this was during the time he was depressed in spring. It was around the springtime because of the fact it talks about the pilgrimage. And usually um, from the studies, it shows that his his pilgrimage, there were three festivals that were observed by the Jewish people. It was Passover, the Feast of Booths, which happens in the uh, autumn, fall. And then there's the Feast of, what is it? The Feast of Booths, the Feast of, the Feast of, um, oh, 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 I had it, Pentecost. Ah! Pentecost is next week Sunday, by the way, guys. I should have known that. But the Pentecost, which is normally the springtime. So it's believed during this Pentecost season, which we all know is 40 days after Easter. For the Hebrews, it would be 40 days after Passover. So it was during this Pentecost season, a time where it should be celebration and happy times. He was feeling the most, the sons of Korah were feeling depressed. They were feeling disquieted in their soul. They were feeling let down. They were feeling like if there was no way out. But God, I love what they say. They say, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I'm on verse 4. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. That's the feast I'm talking about, the um, Pentecost feast. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Mizar. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. I'll read on. All your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning? because of the oppression of the enemy. As with the breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. What does the scripture say? My help cometh from the Lord, the Lord that made heaven and earth. Our help will always come from God. Always know that there is never any situation that God cannot keep you or he cannot pull you out of. There is never a situation that is hopeless. There is never a situation where it feels like if there's no way out. There is always hope. God is always there. If no one is there who you can call on, you can call on God. And he is an ever-present help in the time of trouble. Whenever you're going through, whatever you're going through, God is always there to intervene and to see where you are and pull you up out of that place 
place. He does not want his people to live in a place of quiet desperation. He does not want his people to live in misery, to live in defeat, to live in a situation where they feel like if there is no hope or there's no way out. There is hope in God. And the enemy will desire to take our lives and make us feel like if our lives are worthless. But in God, we are not worthless. For in fact, what did he do? He gave his only son as a sacrifice so that we can have life and we can have it more abundantly. He cared that much for us, but the enemy will deceive us into thinking that we're not loved, we're not cared for, that God doesn't care about what happens to us, and that if we were to close our eyes tomorrow, nobody would miss us, which is a lie from the pits of hell, because God recognizes how much valued we are. What did he say in his word? We're fearfully and wonderfully made in his image and likeness. He loves us ever so much with an everlasting love. There is nothing that can separate us from his love. And no matter how much the enemy will try to speak to us or look at us or make us feel as if we don't measure up or we don't matter, God sees value in us. He has a purpose for us. I love the passage that says, for I know the thoughts I have for you, plans to give you a future, plans to give you a hope, plans to give you an expected end. God has plans for us. He has plans for our future. And the enemy knows that God is up to something. He can't see the future, but he knows that God is up to something. So what does he do? He tries to debilitate and he tries to intimidate and he tries to suck the very life out of you so that you won't realize your full potential in God. But the key is to recognize the plans of the enemy and recognize when he is trying to design to take you out and make up your mind that you will stand regardless of the situation, regardless of the circumstances. You know, our, our answer is not to take a pill or to take drugs or to take alcohol as an escape. God wants us to head on face those problems with him, recognizing that the battle's not ours, it's God's. We just need to leave it in God's hands. Stop worrying about it, stop stressing about it, but give it to God. Stop trying to figure it out, understand God's already worked it out, and trust that he will be able to keep us and provide for us and protect us from all harm and all danger. But a lot of times what happens, we try to take it on ourselves in our own ability, in our own talent, and say, okay, well, I have the intellect, so I should be able to figure this out. I have the looks, so I should be able to be flirt my way out, you know? <laughs> I should, I have, you know, the, you know, I have the money, I could buy my way out, you know? Or I have the skill set, so I could just figure it out and work it out. God's not looking at your looks. He's not looking at your talent. He's not looking at any of those things. He wants you to know that you are nothing without him, but you are everything to him. And he has so much more in store for you than you possibly could imagine. And we just have to recognize who we are. Recognize your value. Recognize your worth. You know, a lot of times you'll be in situations, and I was in a situation like that for about a year and a half where my, my, my psyche, I was constantly being attacked in my skill set, an area that I was feeling insecure about. And the enemy knew that the area was that I was insecure about. And so he kept attacking me in that area and making me feel that if I was not worth it or that I was not worthy. And it literally, the enemy kind of intimidated me and constantly put me down and made me feel like if I was worthless or that I was not intelligent enough or I wasn't capable enough and constantly was putting others up above me. But one day I got fed up and I decided I wasn't going to allow the enemy to intimidate me anymore. And I stood up in the righteousness in which God had called me to be and said that I was not going to take it anymore. And I decided to leave that situation. And I thank God for deliverance because of the fact that a lot of times when you're being bullied and when you're being intimidated and when the enemy is speaking down to you and making you feel like if this is the only way. You have to put up with this. You have to put up with me because I'm your only, I'm your bread and butter. Without me, you're nothing. You have to recognize at some point in your life that you don't, nobody has the right 
to stand in the place of God in your life. We have to recognize that whenever the enemy will try to bully you and intimidate you and make you feel like there is no way out and that the only way you're going to survive is through him, that's when you have to take a stand and say, you know what? I don't care what it's going to cost me. I don't care what the enemy says. I'm going to stand out and trust God anyway. Even though it doesn't make sense, even though it doesn't make you know a whole lot of Um, it, It doesn't make sense in the world's mind, but it makes sense in God's economy. Because what does God trust, uh, challenge us to do in his word? He says, faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And sometimes we have to step out on faith. Sometimes we have to step out of our comfort zone. You know, I love the Indiana Jones movie. I do. I love the Indiana Jones movies. You know why? There's a specific instance in the movie, and I probably shared this with you before. There's a scene where um, he has this book, and he's trying to get to this treasure. And so he opens up this book, and it set to shows how he has to step out in order for him to be able to get to the, the desired treasure. But in order for him to step out and get to the treasure, there's this huge chasm like almost like has anybody ever seen the Grand Canyon imagine having to step out on the Grand Canyon and walk across it to get to the the gold or the treasure not many of us would want to do that correct <laughs> and so but any so he had a chasm just like that in front of him and he just took a deep breath he looked at the picture because the picture just showed the man just stepping out And he decided, okay, this is what the book says to do, so I'm going to step out. And sure enough, he stepped out, and then all of a sudden, in front, there was an invisible bridge that took him across the chasm. He didn't know that that bridge was there because you couldn't see it. The only way he was able to know was by stepping out and trusting that he wasn't going to fall. And that is what God's calling us to do today, is to step out and trust that he's not going to let us fall. Is step out and trust that he's in control. Step out and trust that no matter what the enemy may try to do to intimidate or keep you back or keep you in that comfort zone or keep you in a place where he's giving you the little bits that he has to give you, recognizing that, you know what, there's greater treasure on the other side. Sometimes you need to just put the enemy in his place (laughs) and recognize who God is. Recognize, stand up and recognize who you are in God and take that leap of faith and step out and recognize the treasures that God has for you that he's wanting to give you. Don't settle for the bits and crumbs and the things that the enemy wants to give you. Recognize that God has so much more in store for you than you possibly can imagine. And every time that we give in to the enemy and say, okay, I'm going to just take whatever the enemy is going to give me, what you're doing is shortchanging God. You're making the enemy greater than God in your life. Recognize that you are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation unto God. And because we are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, we don't settle for just anything. We don't just settle just to be given crumbs. The Lord wants us to, he places a table before us in the presence of our enemy. The children, I love what Jesus said to you know the widow woman. He said, it's not for me to give the children's bread to the dogs, you know? But the widow woman, or the, not the, I don't know if she was widow or not, but the mother who wanted deliverance for a child, she said, yes, but even the children, I mean, the dogs eat the crumbs from the floor. And it was so funny that, you know, in that analogy, you look at it and it seems like God with Jesus was being ever so rude. But that's how much he cares about his people. He's letting us know that you don't just, dogs eat crumbs, children eat bread. He doesn't, he cares that much about us. And notice that, you know, in that story, of course, God healed the woman's um, child. But it's an important thing to recognize our value in God in that story. In God's eyes, we need to stop settling for second best. We need to stop settling for being in the back seat. We need to stop taking and cowering to the enemy. But we need to recognize and stand up in the righteousness that God has called us to and be who he's called us to be. That's what, you know, I, why God calls us the deeper calls to deep. He's calling us to deeper places in him, a deeper walk with him, a deeper wa- talk with him. Because as long as we're walking in the deep things of God, then you can step out and make those leaps of faith and trust God when it seems impossible. As long as we stay on the shallow end, 
guess what? We're going to have shallow faith, and we're going to continue to settle for the crumbs that the enemy gives us. But when we decide that we don't want to eat crumbs anymore, we're not going to scrape by anymore. I'm tired of begging the enemy for little bits and pieces when I can trust God and believe him for great, bountiful blessings. God is wanting us to recognize who we are in him and stand up with our heads held high, walking within the authority that he's called us to, not cowering to the enemy, not being intimidated by the enemy, not backing down, but recognizing that we are God's children. We are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation unto God. Recognize that his love is ever abounding. He loves us ever so much, and he desires nothing but great things for us, and he doesn't want us to settle anymore for the little bits that the enemy is offering us, but step out on faith and trust him, trust him for the great treasures he has in store for us. Better than we could possibly imagine. And the treasures I talk about is not so much about the monetary. It's about the peace of knowing that no matter what happens, I'm in, God is in control. I'm not in control. God is in control. It's being able to sleep knowing that, okay, I don't know how I'm going to be able to pay this mortgage next month. I don't know how I'm going to fix this car next week. I don't know how I'm going to pay this water bill. I don't know how I'm going to take care of all these different bills that are coming. But you know what? I'm going to go ahead and have a good night's sleep without any added drugs, without any alcohol, because I'm resting in the comfort of knowing that my God is in control. Control. Amen. I don't know where my husband is. I don't know who he's with today, who he's with tomorrow. I don't know what he's what he's up to, but I'm going to stop worrying about my husband, but I'm going to rest in the peace of knowing that God is in control and God's got him. I prayed and I'm leaving him in God's hands. I don't know what my wife's up to. I don't know why she's off here, off there with this person, that person. It's been rumored that she's stepping out on me and doing this and doing that, but I'm not worrying about that. I'm trusting God for my wife. I don't know about my children. I don't see where they are. They're always here. They're always there. They're, I'm hearing that they're into this. They're robbing liquor stores. They're doing all kinds of crazy things. But I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to rest and trust in God. Doesn't it make you feel a whole lot better? Like a weight's been lifted <laughs> when you just say, you know what? I don't have all the answers. I don't know how I'm going to be able to do this. I don't know what's going to become of my children. Oh, but I do know that I've given them to God, and everything's going to be all right. Amen? And that's the assurance that God wants us to have today. He wants us to have that assurance that, no, we don't have all the answers. No, we didn't figure it all out. No, my life isn't perfect, but... I have a rest and assurance that God is in control and that no matter what comes my way, he is going to keep me. He said he will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. You ever watch horses? You ever watch a race horse? They have those little blinders on. Why do they put those little blinders on those horses? Because they want the horses to stay focused on doing the, on the race. They don't want them folk because if those horses are easily distracted. That's why they put those bridles on <laughs> so that they won't be distracted. God knows that we can be easily distracted. You know, that's what made Peter sink because he was being distracted by the waves and the crashes and like, uh oh, what am I doing? I'm stepping out of this boat. I'm getting out of the safe zone. Just go to just because Jesus called me. He forgot for a second because the fact his focus was not on Jesus. His focus was on the waves. As long as he had gotten out of the boat, it took a lot of courage to get out of the boat, unlike the other disciples. But because he took his focus off of Jesus and focused on the circumstances, he started to sink. But God wants us to keep our focus on God. And that way the enemy cannot whisper in our ear that our lives don't matter and start getting us into thinking that we need to check out today because our lives doesn't matter. That's how he's able to get us to the place where we say, you know what, I'm not going to worry about what tomorrow holds. I'm going to trust God that he's got me today, and tomorrow will take care of itself. It's the assurance of walking in the peace of knowing who God is. Amen? So this morning, I'll leave you today. Um, I wanted us to bow our heads and pray, because as I was praying, like I said, and as I was preparing this message, um, the Lord laid on my heart 
uh, depression and suicide. And I don't know who's dealing with it. I don't know why God laid that message on my heart. And I'm not going to ask the person to call, uh, to call anybody out. I don't want to embarrass anyone. I do want the prayer workers, those who are available to work in the altars, to come. And I just ask everybody to bow their heads. And we're going to pray. And as the Lord lays on your heart to come forward, you can come forward. Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning on behalf, Lord God, of the souls, Lord God. You see, Lord God, the enemy is going after the souls of our young people, the souls of our elderly, the souls of our middle-aged, and the souls of our young adults, Lord. And Heavenly Father, we know, Lord God, that you are greater than the enemy. And we pray even now for anyone, Lord God, who's feeling hopeless, who's feeling despondent, who's feeling left down, feeling as if their lives don't matter, and if they were not here the next morning, nobody would care. But you care, Lord. You love us. You know where we are. You know the number of hairs on our head. You know the number of bones in our body. You made us fearfully and wonderfully in your image and likeness. You recognize our value, Lord, even when we don't always see our value. And I just pray, Lord God, for those souls who are struggling right now with recognizing their value in you. And I just pray, Lord God, that as people examine their hearts, I pray, Lord God, you'll help those who are struggling, Lord God, with recognizing their value to come before the altar, Lord God, and seek out someone to pray with, Lord God, that you will bring them out of this dark place and help them, Lord God, to see the marvelous light in you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God, for your word, and thank you for your promises to let us know that we're valued, that we matter, that if no one else asks for us or looks for us, you look for us, you call for us, you care about us. And I just pray, Lord God, if there's anyone here that's broken, who's hurting, who's needing someone, Lord God, to touch them and pray with them. I pray that they will have the courage to come out of their seat, seek out someone to pray with, and that they will connect with, Lord God, and get the deliverance that they need, Lord. Because we know, Lord God, how important they are to you and how much you cherish their souls. And I pray, Lord God, that not another soul gets lost to the enemy, Lord God, but that we will be walk out this day victorious, winning more souls for your kingdom, Lord God, because that's what it's really about, Lord God, is your souls for your kingdom. And I just pray for those souls today. In the name, Lord Jesus, have your way. In the name, Lord Jesus, have your way. Have your way, O oh God. Have your way, O oh God. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way.